to get my vodka refilled. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, is this working? We can talk through this plant, I guess. We can? Oh, here, let me. Here, we're moving back. Let me take, All yeah, right. look at this. There, there. Oh. Now, okay, here, let's, <laughs> we'll put it down there. Oh, yeah. there. Well, okay. first of all, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us. And David and Robert, thank you all so much for coming to Florida and joining us at the end. You're welcome. Um, it was so great to be able to watch Airplane again, and I cannot tell you how many times I've seen it, but every time I laugh at just, it's always funny. So I have no idea how you do that. Neither do I. I, I <laughs> this is a surprise to me every time I see it, but uh, no, it's, uh, I think for the most part we probably avoided you know, topical humor. So there's a few things in there, references to commercials of the era that nobody understands. But the rest of it is you know, just pretty much understandable by even this audience. Yeah. But it, it, the wonderful thing is that it's, what it's did I say? timeless. Yes. Right, yes. It's timeless. And so, it, yes. you know, even for my kids and the generations to come, it is just funny. Well, it's we, we just funny. hope that people will continue to enjoy it. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they keep having new crops of, uh, when I go around and meet folks, I have families come up and it's the parents that are my age and their kids and their, you know, and then their younger kids and younger kids and younger kids all the way down to little, little tiny ones. And all of them love it. And they, so there are new crops of um, twisted, insane children <laughs> coming up all the time, <laughs> which is nice. So I had to wait, um, I think it was about 12 years before I could show my kids your movies. And, um, you know, because I had to kind of decide what, what was okay. What because Jell-O is unhealthy and you don't want to show <laughs> Jell-O. Yeah. I don't know, I never found any of it objectionable. And my son, I used to watch it with my son when he was like one year old. And, <laughs> He loved it, and his favorite part was the boobs that went across the street. Yes. And, then, and so we actually, then we started watching a lot of softcore porn together. And, you know, I saw it as like, it's great, and he saw it as food. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we kind of bonded on that, on that whole thing. And, and, and um, his, David's son is now 17, and uh, Robert, your son is? 26. 26. And both, I'd like to say, both of the kids are in therapy, have been for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and David, your son, what, what is his um, vocation for the moment? Well, I mean, he's a, he's a junior in high school, <laughs> but his hobby, he's a stunt driver. So he's, you know, he can... He can back up a car at 60 miles an hour and then do a donut turn and, and do all that stuff. So it's something he likes to do. I mean, I, I won't let him do that for a living, but... I hope. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, well, like, you know, he's totally unlike me. He's good at math and science and, you know, just, that's fine. He's, yeah. When I worked for David out in L.A. for a few years, he had a deal at Sony Studios and they had the most fabulous offices. Michael Jackson had offices right above us. There was this big Miro print on the wall when you'd walk in, and they had the most jovial atmosphere. David and his brother and Jim and everyone were always playing tricks on each other, so it was a pleasure to work out there. And he was involved in more things then you could shake a stick at. I mean, are, are you still involved in electric cars? Well, yeah, I've, I was driving electric cars and, you know, the environmental movement, uh, probably starting in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And then I joined an organization in Los Angeles called Tree People, Tree People. which, mm -hmm. you know, we plant trees. That's hard to imagine. Um, and, and uh, you know, so it's kind of, that's kind of been a hobby. And then, and then I've been interested in history and Davy Crockett. So. Mm -hmm. I, I've, you know, we, we've, I've just into that, all that stuff. This is not, has nothing to do with airplane, but 
No, it doesn't. You're asking the no, question, so yeah. That is true. I don't that know what you're true. getting at. Well, <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah. I'm trying to yeah, get there. But the, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Robert, what was your favorite thing about working with David? <laughs> you could make I'm glad this. that this is all about me. <laughs> yes. Well, my son likes music, and uh, <laughs> he likes. Uh, <laughs> Good, yeah. Keep it down. People, people ask if, is, what was it like working on the show? Um, because, you know, oh, you must have laughed all the time, and how could you get anything done? Because you're cracking up all the time. You're probably spoiling takes. Well, like David was talking about earlier, we, we, they, Derry, uh, David and Jerry and, and Jim, had been writing the script for five years or so. Yeah. And they kept coming back and rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. So they were totally inundated with it. They knew the jokes. Um, the guys, you know, on the set were familiar with it, the key people. And then the actors, we get the script and we read it and we laugh. The first time I read it was on an airplane. <laughs> and I was flying back to Minneapolis, St. Paul from LA. And there was something literally no exaggeration. There was something on every single page that made me not just kind of chortle to myself, but I actually laughed out loud, made a sound. I laughed out loud. Something on every single page. The stewardess came up. She was prim, proper, had a bun, looked like a you know a librarian, very kind of puckered, a puckery librarian, and and um, and cute. Your librarian, okay. <laughs> And uh, she came up and she said, I couldn't help but notice you, you seem to be enjoying what you're reading there. Um, I was wondering what it was. I said, it's a script. I'm going to go meet with them on Monday when I get back. Would you like to read it when I'm done? She said, thank you very much. So I finished and then I let her read it. Right behind the, the cockpit, they had the jump seats for the stewardesses. So she sat down and had her prim and proper little knees together. And she opened the script up and I looked at her. And uh, right down the aisle, you know, looked at her, and and she opened it up and started reading. And I looked up later, and she was looking at it and kind of smiling a little bit. And then I looked a little bit later, and she was looking at it and really starting to laugh. Then I looked at it later. Pretty soon, her knees were up in the air. Her hair was coming undone, and she was laughing. And later in his hotel room, her knees were oh, up, in yeah, up in the air. <laughs> So you, you want to tell the rest of the That story. was a yoga thing. That was totally a yoga thing. Yeah. But um, that was the first time that I read it. Um, and then I met with, with the boys. And fortunately for me, I got, I got the role. So I read it over and over and over and over. You, you read it a lot when you're learning the lines. And, and so, and having come from the stage, I, I was, you know, stage actors normally, usually not always, are trained. You kind of develop a sense of being able to hold it together. Someone tries to crack you up, they're always doing that, especially in long runs and shows and theater. And so I was kind of, kind of, of you know, inured to that. And, uh, and the fact that we'd gone over it so much, we had seven weeks to shoot the film, and so we had to get it done. And the only one that really got me was Leslie with that <laughs> damn fart machine that he kept <laughs> squeezing, and he had like a whoopee cushion in his hand. And he would do it to everybody, anyone, all the time, especially once we found out about it. But he especially did it to me on my close-ups. So <laughs> when he and Randy are in the cockpit, and it's Mr. Stryker, you know, I say, both engines. Mr. Stryker, can you land this, this uh, you know? Well, I, I, my line is, well, I flew single-engine fighters in the war, but this plane has four engines. That's an entirely different kind of flying altogether. And then they say it altogether. <laughs> And all I heard was, Mr. Stryker, can, can you land, land this plane? And I had to keep a straight face through that. So that was the hardest part. But mostly it was do it. If you can keep the laugh inside you and you let somebody else laugh, you don't laugh. It diffuses the whole thing. So you keep it inside. And I used to see if I could crack up the crew, let them screw up the take which I was able to do a couple of times. But we, we made it through the whole seven weeks pretty fast, and, uh, which is a short, a short schedule for a feature film. 
<laughs> Where was I going with this? Well, and how many so people what? have committed Harry Carrier? <laughs> While he's telling the story, we're all. <laughs> all right, well, why don't we open it up now to questions from the audience? And um, okay. yes, either side of the microphone. So why don't we take your question? Should he get up and go to the I've microphone? Got a loud voice as well. You have a loud voice. Um, I remember a Kentucky Fried movie and Kentucky Fried Theater. Was there a division of labor that you guys had specifically, or did you just was everything a mix all together? Well, there was there was we did it really all together. Most of directing is, you know, the pre-planning, the the pre-production, the writing of the script, and we we all contributed to that, of course, and and you know, deciding on sets, costumes, you know, casting. And so by the time you get on the set, it's mainly problem solving. So if something doesn't work, then we just have to figure it out. And, there's, and the clock is always ticking. So uh, generally, we confer, and then Jerry would relay the instructions to the actors so that the actors wouldn't be too confused by three directors. Thank you. Okay. Because the actors were confused and, and then, enough. And Jim and I would be watching uh, the monitor while, uh, the, as the takes went on. Jerry would be watching live on the set. And because mainly comedy happens in that frame. And we see a, what, we, what Jim and I saw was a lot different than what Jerry was seeing. So but it he, really helped. People don't realize a lot of times is the cinematographer is looking at what is going to be on the screen, but he also sees this whole area all around it. And he can tell if things are coming in or going out, if it made it in this, the, the, you know, the frame or if he has to keep away from it or whatever. They had their monitor taped off so they could only see what was going to be on the screen. So if Jerry said, cut, that was good for me. How about you guys? And he said, this didn't happen or this did happen or, you know. Or and it was when good. I was directing on my own, like starting with the first Naked Gun, and other pictures after that, then I, I never would be watching the actual take on the set. I always watch the monitor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. no more questions from you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. The young man over here, quite dark back there. Hi there. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious on what the impetus was on creating this movie and then the process of writing all the gags what your process was and how much of that actually happened on set? That's a good question. We, we, uh, we love to watch old movies. And I mean, you know, our movies that we were fans of were, you know, the Marx Brothers and Woody Allen. And we, we loved those as comedies. But what we loved most of all was watching old serious movies, black and white movies. So we happened on this one movie uh, called Zero Hour, which is uh, made in 1957. Has anybody ever heard of this? Okay, so this is, you can actually look this up on YouTube and people have done compilations of scenes from Zero Hour and scenes from Airplane. They're identical except that Airplane, of course, has the jokes. So what we did was took the plot from Zero Hour, all the characters, everybody, you know, hard hitting things. And instead of, we used to redub these movies, you know, put our own, you know, voices on the characters and make them say crazy things. So. Our idea for Airplane was to actually cast it you know, as these movies would be cast, at, almost as though we cast the actors and didn't tell them it was a comedy. So that, that was kind of a leap. And so we cast you know, Robert Stack, Peter Graves, Lloyd Bridges, and of, of course, Leslie Nielsen. And Bob Hayes you know, was in a sitcom, but we said, well, we're, we'll overlook that. <laughs> and really. And in fact, they all came in. Leslie came in and said, you know, I was on a mash. And we said, nah, we'll pretend we didn't hear that. <laughs> and Robert Stack was very, you know, excited about this movie he had just done with Spielberg called 1942 or 1941. Yeah, okay, yeah, one of those one numbers. One of those 40s. No. And, uh, but but we, what we wanted to do was do a comedy without comedians where everybody would be just delivering the lines with straight face. And that, that, was, a, that was a leap and fortunately we got the studio to approve it and over the objections of our casting director, I was just talking to you <laughs> earlier, you know, by the time we cast Leslie Nielsen and he was the last one uh, cast, uh, the guy, he just blew up. He said, Leslie Nielsen. Leslie Nielsen is the guy you cast the night before. And then he was six weeks out from production. And we were all excited to get him. But he turned out to be 
there was, know, to have the career. People have asked me about, the, there's, there was a thing that, that I thought about when we were doing it, and, and afterwards I thought about some comedies that you see, and some well-known comedies. Um, you'll see the, the person uh, that's on screen, and it's almost like there's a little astral projection of them standing next to him, looking at the audience saying, this is funny, isn't it? But with us, our little astral projections would stand out and look at the audience and say, what the hell are you laughing for? This is serious stuff. And that seemed to kind of make it funnier. And that was the brilliance of the boys doing that and sticking by their guns when they wanted to have you know, the comedy actors and comedians doing it. And they said, no, we want it serious. That was part of the genius of the whole deal. And one of the problems we had was that on the set, you know, Bob was mostly on astral projection. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, that was something that we, we had to overcome. Genetic. And, uh, anybody Thank else? You. Thank you. OK, this man over here, please. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I was wondering if you had any anecdotes about Leslie Nielsen on set and or Jonathan Banks um, working with them, or any anecdotes that you might share? Well, they, really the best anecdote about Leslie was, you know, how he tortured Hayes. I mean, <laughs> you know, and we, sometimes, yeah, it was, that was probably the longest group of takes that we had to take. And Jonathan Banks uh, happened to be just a, a working actor who, uh, oh, very we, we, he was uh, a client at our law firm at the time, and they suggested him. And, uh, and there's a character in Zero Hour who is exactly that character, and he fit that mold. So yeah. that's why we cast him. Thank you. Sir? Uh, I read originally that you wanted to shoot the movie in black and white. Yeah. Uh, but you had to fight with Bob Eichner. With Michael Eisner, who oh, was Michael the head Eisner. of yes. Paramount. And uh, we, we, had it in, we, we had it in our minds that we wanted to shoot this on a prop plane and in black and white because of zero hour. That's how we wanted to exactly duplicate that. And so uh, the studio didn't want us to do that. And you know, we tried every means to you know, hold our own. Finally, we, we had this meeting on Friday in Michael Eisner's office. And we had very few meetings of him because he really existed at 30,000 feet. And so we explained all our great reasons why we wanted this to be on a prop plane and in black and white. And he listened carefully and said, well, you certainly have you know, made a, a good argument for that. We're starting to feel pretty good about ourselves. And, uh, and in fact, uh, you may go on to make this movie in black and white and on a prop plane, but it won't be at the studio. <laughs> And so we're kind of like <laughs> pressed back into our chairs. And he said, but uh, let's not decide now. Why don't you guys think about it over the weekend and come back Monday and we'll, we'll discuss it more. You know, he just was so great at handling us and handling the situation. <laughs> and so we, we came back. And of course, we caved. And, uh, and the other thing is that he was right. So, um, so but, but he always thought that we, we got him back because the sound of the, of the plane is not a jet engine, it's a, it's a prop engine. But, but we wanted to do everything we could to give it that feel of, of really film noir and black and white. Thank you. Thanks. Sir? Hi, thank you for being here. I enjoyed seeing it on the big screen. I have a question about political correctness. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, I feel like that phrase has been co-opted and, and th that people use it as a code and they say, I hate political correctness and it's a license to be ignorant or insensitive or something. So I, I you know, it's, it's hard to bring this up, but I'm wondering uh, if you believe this movie could be made in 2017 and if you think political correctness uh, kills comedy. Well, I think it, it could definitely be made. It just wouldn't be um, rated PG anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think they'd probably slap an R on it because, I mean, there's, there's certain standards that they have. R. With, Thanks. you know, with, with a, the subject matter, yeah. uh, some of the nudity and the, 
the drug humor. And, well, the nudity was probably yeah, that the most Yeah, that puts you into R. And, but in those days, PG-13 hadn't been invented. So, uh, and I think they were much, you know, more liberal with the R-rated R stuff. But, you know, what, what really matters is if it gets a laugh. And, you know, some people say, you know, certain things aren't politically correct today. But if they, if they weren't, if they truly weren't politically correct today or truly offensive, people wouldn't laugh. I think people appreciate Airplane in the spirit that it's given and you know, they, I think they just appreciate it for that it's funny, and they they put the politics away. Yeah, and also, I think it watching it it, um, it helps to keep people okay. Let's cut through the crap. It, it's funny, and quit you know being so full of yourself. This is funny. It needs to be made fun of, and so we're going to do it. And it's like a it's like there there are things that have happened that. Um, it's taboo to talk about them until comedians start talking about them. And then they're really, you know, like, oh my God, you talked about that. But it was the first time. Then it's like it breaks through the wall. Then they, people start making more jokes about it. And the next thing you know, it, 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 it cracks the pressure cooker and lets some of the steam out. So there's not so much tension about that. So I think being ridiculously silly can be very, Healthy. <laughs> Did that answer your question? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Okay, young lady over here, please. Thank you for calling me young. So um, you said that the key to this was to play it straight, but knowing what the jokes were after reading the script and knowing where it was going, how did you do that without overdoing it? And then, you know, some of the jokes, the Harry Krishnas at the airport, which I'm old enough to remember and some might not be, yeah. it's still funny today. Why do you think that that is? Yeah, there are, there are always some jokes that are still funny today for, for one reason or another. The fact that, you know, the airline pilot is, you know, punching people out in the, in the airport <laughs> is still funny, I guess. Uh, I think we, it still gets a laugh when she says, uh, Jim doesn't, <laughs> Dude does take drink my coffee at home or something, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but for some reason people still laugh. But but that was an ad. Yeah, it was an a ad. Cup yeah. of coffee. But it, I think that if you if something is done well, if you just catch it like they caught all of the moments when when we as actors do our performance, do the best we can, and if we go again, and you know we're able to do another take and they'll capture whichever take it is. They capture that moment if it's funny and if it's done really well. It's done really well. If you look at films from the 30s, 40s, you'll see things that were just done so well, they're still great today. So, uh, you know, when, when the, same, the same, you know, talking about the, my husband never has the second cup at home, and then when he throw, throws up, and then he looks at her, and then he throws up again, <laughs> It cracks me up every time. Jim never throws up twice at home, you know. <laughs> it's, if it's funny, it's funny, and it's going to last a long time. Well, I think we were lucky on that one. Yeah. Yeah, well. Thank you. Thank you. Is there, yes? You, sir? Somebody Thank else. you. Um, I actually have two quick questions. Uh, one, um, we're talking about how the fact that the actors, everyone was playing it serious or straight. Um, delivering the lines, but then Steven Strucker's character, which is fabulous and very funny, but is very out of character for the rest of, of, of the production, where he's playing it more over the top. What was the decision behind that? Um, and Mr. Hayes, did you do all your own dancing in that scene? <laughs> he can tell you about Steven. Yeah, Steven. And yes, I did. <laughs> Except, except for one backflip. Otherwise, he, he, does a, he does a backflip, and then that was a stunt man. Yeah, and you and can then see me hiding back there. You can actually see, and yeah. you know, we didn't do more than a couple of takes. Right, so. that we were really racing to get. But you can see the stunt. You see Bob crouching and then waiting to <laughs> come up. And and we we also it was low budget. We yeah. had, but we had um, uh, Jerry uh, Mahoney, I think was or Tom Mahoney was our choreographer, and uh, Lester, oh gosh, 
and Lester had been one of the choreographers on Saturday Night Fever. So we actually had one of the guys who was an actual choreographer on that show. And Steven Stucker had been our piano player in, in Kentucky Fried Theater, and this was a, uh, you know, it was a review sketch theater that we operated <coughs> for five years on Pico Boulevard in West LA in the, uh, in, in the first half of you know, the 1970s. And, uh, and we just thought he was hilarious, and, uh, and so we just really wanted to find a role for him in, in Airplane, and we were able to just cast him in this, and it was, it just works, because it's, it's Stucker, he's a force of nature, and, and, and he's, uh, you know, we were on stage with him in the theater, and we, we were invisible, he just, everybody went to see him, he was so the, great. The, how many people have ever heard of the Kentucky Fry Theater? I, it's one of my favorite stories is um, about when you were struggling along yeah. and then you got the, the billboard incident. Oh, the billboard, yeah, we, well, when we first came to LA, uh, we didn't have any publicity budget or any ad budget and uh, it was a big city. And so we called the show My Nose and uh, so that our, our listing every week in the LA Times calendar section read My Nose runs continuously <laughs> and and then and then on top of then we there was a there was a vacant lot next to the theater and this is what you're referring to that uh that you know changed every month so we paid a couple hundred bucks we rented this billboard for a month and we put a big sign saying this is it kentucky fried theater and then we organized a neighborhood protest against it and <laughs> Yeah. We, and we called in all the, the newspapers and the, the television stations. And you split your and, friends, right? And we, well, yeah, we protesting. split our friends protesting. Well, and the, the premise was, and we said to the media that uh, the, the protesters were, there, there was a big corporation that planned to tear down the sign and plant a tree in its place. And so the protest was save the sign. <laughs> save the sign. And so they just loved it. They all covered it. This was, you know. And, and we were packed after that. Yeah. So every night you'd see my yeah. nose runs continuously right, on the yeah. news. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So that's how, brilliance. Robert, how long did it take you to learn the dance from Saturday Night Fever? Julie and I, boy, I don't remember, but Julie and I would go over and rehearse. We'd just you know, have an hour, a few hours to go and rehearse and uh, over and over and over. A period of time before we started filming. I think you might have been but better what, than. And what happened? Did you do weekends while you were okay. while we were yeah. shooting. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah. but uh, what happened was we got we got there, and <clears throat> if the camera is out where you are, like it, I guess would be, and I uh, see her throw my hat, comes back, hits the guy in the head, and I come up to her, and I'm facing her like this. Well, we learned the dance as if the camera was over here. It looks better for the camera to be over here. So <laughs> the boy said, well, we, we can't do it this way. We can't, we can't shoot it this way. Can you, how do you, we're gonna aim it this way? And I came up with one of my few actual contributions myself to the thing. I said, what if I come up to her and stalk her like an animal in the jungle? And then we turn like that. And then I'm on the right side. Then I take my jacket off, throw it, strike the pose. Jacket comes back, hits me in the face. And then we start the dance. So we tried it and it was like, hey, it works. I actually felt like, I felt so good. It was my first feature film and I actually came up with an idea. So that's a big thing for a young actor, to have an idea. That was, it was, it was a great idea. And, and most Save of your suggestions, film. we said, no, that's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> but this was a great, brilliant idea. This one actually, and I was told yeah. more than once, it saved the film. It saved yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I can see There's that. There's a yeah, slim margin between <laughs> success and failure. Yeah. Yes. yes. You know, my favorite one is, well, it used to be when all the, the reporters came and knocked down the, the thing, but I don't know, you know, there are no phone booths anymore. I don't know how many, that's another one of these old gags, but yeah. 
the joke that I, I really love the best because it's, it's all in one shot and it was funny 30 years ago and it'll be funny 30 years from now is when uh, you know, the, the, the stewardess uh, breaks down and says, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 26 and I'm not married. And then the next lady comes up, how are you bearing up? Well, pretty good, but at least I've got a husband. You know? And it's like, nobody's being funny, you know? It's just, it's all just very serious. And I love that gag, yeah. I, 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 there's so many, it's hard to, but I love when, um, Peter Graves, you know, comes out of the cockpit, and Lloyd comes up to him, and uh, I mean, I mean, uh, Leslie comes up to him, and says, uh, "How long before we can land?" He says, "Well, I can't tell. You can tell me. I'm a doctor. <laughs> I just don't know." And he says, "Well, can't you take a guess?" Well, not for another three hours. <laughs> you can't take a guess for three hours. It just gets me. Oh. Just gets me a scene. Yeah. It gets me every time. And I th the favorite thing of mine that that Bob did was when he said, uh, you know, it's an entirely different kind of flying altogether. And then they go, it's an entirely different kind of flying. And then we cut to Bob, and he he goes, he does that little reaction before plunging on with the line. Never, there, there's a little. My eyebrow went up. His eyebrow. Yes. Yeah. It's actually this one. And and I remember you guys all came back after dailies and they never saw it when we shot it but we came back after dailies and suddenly it's on a big screen yeah. and they said your eyebrow went up and it just that's kind of punctuated that's what thing. got the laugh I yeah. Think, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you um there's someone back here and then we'll come to you okay please so you had mentioned that it took you five years to develop and, and write the script but the second movie came out only two years later so were you using a bunch of gags that didn't fit in the first one, or what were the kind of pressures you were under to make the second one as funny? Why don't you take well, this well, one? Well, we didn't... <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do Airplane 2. We had a different... They, Paramount wanted to do Airplane 2, and so we said, okay, well, well we, first of all, we didn't want to do it because we, we didn't think there were enough jokes even to fill all of the first one. So. Uh, so we didn't really want to do it. We wanted to move on to something else, but we did, we, we did come up with an idea. I don't know if I ever told you. You said, how about if Bob and Julie land the plane, and then uh, you know, the, it's the end of the first one, and then uh, Stryker takes Julie home to his family, and it's the godfather. And, so, and, and, we, and we would do that. So, right. So, they, but they decided to do Airplane 2, and we, we just, we, we passed on that, but, uh, you know, I think the studio... I was thinking what, of yeah. on a submarine, but, but it, yeah. I don't know why it didn't, no one, uh, obviously they that knew that no been one good. would laugh. But, but I think it, it, so. the movie did well, and we just, yeah. we just didn't, didn't do it. So, uh, was that the whole You question? still haven't seen it. Have I still haven't seen it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll get around to it. Yeah. There's time. There's time. Yeah, there's time. All right. Um, let's see. And we'll go down to you and then back to the young lady and then you. Please. Great. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Jive guys? If I'm not mistaken, I read that they knew each other before. Yes. That Norm and Norm. Al. Mm -hmm. Al White. Norm and Gibbs. so we, we wrote the bit, you know, as as well as, you know, all we knew of Jive was mofo, I think. That was where it ended for us. And so these guys came in, they had been high school friends, and they did, had this routine, that I guess, that they did in high school, and they just did it, the whole thing, exactly as you see in the movie, and, and it cracked us up. actually told me that, I guess maybe in high school they got in it, he found a book, the Dictionary of Black Jive, <laughs> so they could actually figure out some because there was a lot of stuff. So they didn't nothing know. about airplane is authentic. Yes, <laughs> that's right. It's like even that's these right. guys have to look it up in a, in a book. You know. oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, hello. Could you tell us a little bit about working with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? With Kareem. Yeah. Uh, he was tall. Kareem initially. Yeah, he was tall. Yeah. The part was originally because you know we wrote the movie, the first draft in 1975. So, uh, and, and we wrote it for Pete Rose. And, but it was, we were, we were shooting it in, in the summer, so he was still in, in baseball, and, uh, and, you know, betting on baseball at the time, <laughs> and evidently. And so, uh, we, 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 the next choice was Kareem, and we called up Kareem's manager, he read the script, turned it down, 
And so we said, oh my God, we, we gotta have Kareem for this. Because by that time, I think we had written all, all the stuff about you know, not trying and dragging Walton and Lanier right. down, down court and with a little kid. And, uh, and so the manager said, well, you know, I keep his financing, his finances very tight. I've got him on a really short leash. And, but if you offer him $5,000 more, he'll be able to buy this rug that he wants to buy. <laughs> True story. So we offered him $5,000 more, and then he said yes. Now, this is either, you know, an interesting story or the smartest agent that ever lived, <laughs> you know, to get another 5000 out of it. Um, so, and then he was very quiet on the set, you know, not, he's just as you would think he would be. He's very serious and uh, just, you know, very serious, but, you know, he's very nice and was not an actor. You know, he improved over the years, uh, which is more than I can say for Bob. Yeah. But, uh, no, 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 I'm just kidding. Yeah. But he was not, not, Scream wasn't a professional actor. So, uh, and he didn't, he wasn't used to learning lines. So, but fortunately, uh, his, all his parts uh, required him to sit facing forward, and so we had cue cards. And so he was, he's all these, he's reading off of the cue cards, except for where, where he's threatening this kid. Poor kid. That came naturally. Yeah, so. yeah that came yeah. naturally. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I walked okay. up to him the very first Just, day. Yeah, someone and I thought, my gosh, I, I okay. want to go over and oh, yeah. say uh, say hello to him. I thought, gosh, I should be able to say hi. And I'm six, one and a half, six two, and I walked up to a belt buckle right here. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty remarkable, but a yeah. but wonderful guy. Since then, Bob and I have done we've done a series of. Uh, commercials for the Wisconsin Department of Tourism and we and Kareem came in for one of them right found the did, original yeah. right the original the set. airplane set which is yeah. at, in this place in Hollywood somewhere. yes <clears throat> yeah google it it's it's great yeah. it's wonderful let me can we wait one minute because there's a there, it's been populated in, in the back left there um, the man with the green shirt please yeah hi, i just had a question about the the, the fellow who's stranded in the taxi howard jarvis <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, he was a public figure, but he wasn't an actor. How did you pull him into this? Uh, so, you know, somebody suggested it as one of these odd cameos to be in it. And he had, uh, you know, acquired some kind of notoriety because he was the Proposition, uh, Proposition 13. 13. He was, you know, for lower taxes. And much later in life, I came to really appreciate Howard Jarvis because he, <laughs> my property taxes were uh, a lot lower because of him. And so he just came in, and that I think, and his wife was there, and well, he's yeah. a politician. He was right? a politician. Yeah, he was a head of this group. Anyways, he was a nice old guy, and he yeah. was able to do the lines. So yeah. that was, you know, it was Howard Jarvis's, one of those obscure things. And he like, wound up being iconic, like like yeah. Ethel Merman. Yeah. Well, I'll just give him. Yeah. What was it after? Uh, Five hundred thirty-four dollars. Well, I'll just give him twenty more minutes. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you, great. thank you. Okay, sir, yes? Um, with all the reboots, remakes, everything, if Airplane got rebooted, who would you trust to direct or star in the remake of it? No one. Yeah, well. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I would hope that they wouldn't reboot it, because I think Airplane was something that happened at a particular time, and it was a, a one thing. It's, it was nothing that I really considered to be a franchise. However, Naked Gun could be, you know, done as a, that could be done as a franchise. And we did. And we did it till, uh, we did three of them. And, uh, but now I think uh, it probably is time for a reboot of Naked Gun. So we started to work on, uh, on a new Naked Gun called Naked Gun 444 and a quarter. <laughs> Nordberg did it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> And so we're actually writing, and this would be, you know, it's the son, the son of Frank Drebin grows up. And, oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Well, Robert, make sure you get, you know, just have an arrangement with David. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. 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 I'm going to um, be, I'm, I'm going to be doing craft service. No. On <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. One moment. We, the lady in the black back, back there, please. Navy. Oh, I'm. <laughs> She's running the camera, I think. Ah, voila. I, oh, 
I have two questions. Um, one, what are some of the director's cuts? Just one, one scene. And also, what was it like working with Barbara Billingsley? Yeah. Oh, so you want to know what, what was some what was uh, something cut? Some of the director's yeah. cuts. Yeah, there, most of them were just little trims Tiny. to make things shorter, right. to just to make it play faster. One scene that we cut was, uh, you know, we we did some callbacks, which we didn't think were justified. Like I think there was a a second scene where Leslie came in and and uh, said, you. Shirley, you can't be serious or something. Mm -hmm. And Leslie said, I am serious and don't call me Shirley. It was a second time. And you know, in the first run of the movie, it was all hilarity. And then you know, 30 years later, it didn't, didn't work so well. So, so we, we cut it. I, I can't think of any other whole scenes that we cut. But there were like just little trims to m make everything go a little faster. He was trying to be as subtle as possible. Correct? Yes. <laughs> and, and Barbara? Uh, Barbara Billingsley? Well, you know, originally we had offered the part to Harriet Nelson. And uh, from, you know, Ozzy and Harriet. Ozzie and, Harriet. Yeah. and she turned it down. Didn't you run into her? I was later? doing the show. She came to uh, taping of Angie that, uh, when I was doing that show, which overlapped with the filming of Airplane, my two weeks, the last two weeks of Airplane. Uh, Angie came back um, after our break. And, um, and she was there, and I got to meet her in the audience. And she said, I think I either mentioned I heard that you were offered the part, or she said that she was offered the part. <clears throat> and she said that she was so worried. And she was the sweetest woman. She was so wonderful. She said, I, I was really worried about the language, and I'm so sorry I didn't do it. So that was So her. we she went was, to the next, darling. the next candidate was Barbara Billingsley, you know, was Beaver's great. mom. And, and she, was, she was great, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Grew we, up with that. We have yeah. five more minutes, so we have time to take about three more questions, OK? So why don't we take the over here? Yes. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Hi, right, cool. Uh, I don't have a question. I just want to say it's just been a pleasure and an honor to actually be in the same room as you guys. Like, I'm only like 19, but like Mr. Hayes, like you said, uh, like, you know, your parents would show their kids the movies. Said, so, so what now? You said, like, you know, your parents would show the kids the movie oh, that yeah. they would pass on. My dad did that for me. Like, when I was growing up. So I seen Naked Gun, Police Squad, you know, the TV series. Sadly, only lasted six episodes, but right. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, and it's just a pleasure to like sit down and watch a movie where like a lot of movies nowadays is all just, you know, crude sexual humor. And we're all just enjoying like this type of humor, which I think is great. You know, like, and that's why I think Scary Movie 3 and 4, or like my favorite, because Scary Movie 3 and 4 to me are like this type of comedy. And that's why I love that. And like, we were going for the sex in this, right? I mean, really, <laughs> always it didn't yes. seem like it, I guess. <laughs> but and, uh, thank you. No, no, thank, thank, no, okay, thank, thank you, you very much. So much. Yes. Also, uh, it was an awesome cameo to see you in Sharknado 2, I think it was. <laughs> pop yeah. And then you've got to thank my son for that. All right, cool. And then um, also, my uh, my friend and I noticed the one of the cuts that I think you said he cut out was the explosion, yeah. and the guy had the gasoline. You went to light a match. If I, oh, you guys already said it? No. Oh, OK. Um, I think there was actually an explosion that you saw like the flash. But I don't think it was in this one, I think. Oh, was that? Yeah, that's, yeah well, that was that one was of the Jesse. things we cut out. Okay. Yeah, okay. Jesse. Right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. All right, well, it's, yeah, well, it's just been a pleasure to sit here and just watch the movie. And have, thank you for coming today. So. Thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. This young lady here, please. Who doesn't speak English? How old is your yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. But, you know, I don't. I don't know if we. If you know, if we have to explain a joke, they get cut. I think. You know, we we preview the movies, and you know, we generally film a hundred minutes, and then we cut it down to eighty minutes, and uh, you know, th those jokes that we had to explain to an entire audience, we we just cut. So. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and the, the man back here on the left, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hello, I uh, really enjoy your movies, uh, Mr. Zucker. And seeing Airplane and other movies, like Top Secret, over the years kind of changed my thinking. I had like, this little joke in the morning, like when I have breakfast, I'm out to eat, and the waitress asks me, How would you like your eggs? I say, On the plate. And it kind of, <laughs> but I'm but, uh, 
But, was uh, that from Airplane yeah. 2? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. But. Well, that was your joke. Oh, yeah. very, very good. Yeah. And also, uh, Mr. Hayes yeah, enjoyed weird. you in Cat's Eye. Remember that one? That was really cool, too. Mm. But um, uh, my other question was, any chance of an Airplane 3, or if you ever did like another naked gun, you could have Mr. Hayes as uh, Lieutenant Drebin's they, nephew. They, they wanted to do yeah. Airplane 3. I was in England doing a film at the time. Um, Sort of like country dropping, name dropping only with country. Oh, yeah. I was in England at the time. Very good. You went to England. England. Yeah. And um, it was a home movie, but yeah. I don't. That's okay. <laughs> but they wanted to do. They wanted to do Airplane Three, and I was constantly. Every time I would go somewhere, wherever it was an event, and there were paparazzi, or if you were going out to dinner, and the paparazzi, you know, were around or whatever. It really was relentless. They would say, hey, Robert, Airplane Hayes, you ever think you'll be a real actor? You ever think you'll do anything besides Airplane? Over and over, I mean, and, and I was stupid enough to fall for it. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to do Airplane 3 because I'm a real actor. <laughs> and so I was in England being a real actor. And, um, and they said, you know, we want to do Airplane Three and I said no thanks and so they upped the price and, no and they upped the price and they more points on the film I mean it really got big this is when nowadays it's twenty million bucks a picture or whatever but that at that time a million dollars a picture was the deal that was sort of like the benchmark and they got up to a million and a half and they got you know points and and I kept saying no and I actually said no stuck with it and I'm sorry I did because. I, you know, I did some films that I'm sure didn't do as well as what Airplane 3 would have done. And it would be fun just to have had that um, extra film. Actually, it'd be fun to have that extra million and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get honest. But uh, so they wanted to, and then, and then that was it. They said, no, it won't get done. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then I have one other question for you all, quickly. Um, are any of your children, Robert, you get to go first, following in your footsteps? And if not... Yes, and as Zero Mostel said, I told him, use Desinex. <laughs> but, no, he's, he's, um, no, I gave him credit. Yeah. Um, he, my son, Jake, is, uh, is studying acting and improv, and, um, and he's very good. But um, what he's been doing for years now is following more in his mom's footsteps. She was a uh, lead singer with a group called The Runaways. And she was, uh, wrote a book called Neon Angel that they made the book, the movie, The Runaways, about Dakota Fanning played her in the movie. And Kristen Stewart played Joan Jett in the movie, and that's what it was all about. So he's, he played with her and her band, and then his uncle Steve, which is how I met, got into that family, um, Steve Lukather is lead guitarist with Toto. And he's on the road with Ringo Starr, who's a guy who was in a group called The Beatles. <laughs> may have heard. Anyway, Ringo and his all-stars, so he's touring with them. That's his Uncle Steve, and so he's, he grew up with all of this stuff, and he is a wonderful musician. He's got a band called Maudlin Strangers, and he produces Maudlin. other guys, other bands, and um, writes all of it, records everything, engineers it, produces it, and does the artwork for the album covers. Even when he had a record label, record deal, he was doing all of that. So he's very... So he's followed my footsteps, but he's kind of gone off, and he's much more, much more uh, broadly, you know, uh, um, broad interests than just being a, you know, guy that reads other guys' words. <laughs> David, what about you? Um, no. Oh, you're. Not. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. They're just not. You know, they're interested okay. in other things, and okay. that's uh, but, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. We won't talk about that. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much.